So, Max, I, I come from a church background. I started performing in church. Johnny Tudor, obviously, from his showbiz background. What about you? Where, where did you first start performing? Well, uh, obviously, not professionally, but the first time I ever remember standing up was in a, in a, in the local chapel's um, uh, amateur dramatic society. Yeah. And I was up for what this man, Ozzy Powell, uh, he always cast me as like the, the comedy part. And I wasn't like that at all. I was very, very shy. But for some reason, he saw something in me. And, and I, I remember that I can remember the line that always had the big laugh, which is in Welsh. It was, Manu or Dino with it, women they are too. That was, <laughs> that, was that, that was the line. And I, and I think that was the first time I was ever conscious of the thrill of making somebody or people making people laugh. So it was a, a, a comedy drama, Plant of Dolly, the Dolly Chapel's uh, Drama Society, yeah. Okay, and then, of nice. course, uh, it went from there. But I, I, yeah, you always cast me in plays and things. That was the first time I ever remember performing, really. And getting yeah. a, was a guitar a big breakthrough for you then? Should you could accompany yourself? Yeah, I, I, I was really affected, I suppose, by like the skiffle era all the time. Everybody received of a guitar, Donny Donigan, and then, and of course, the inevitable Bert Whedon playing a day guitar, guitar guide, 2,000 chords for guitar. I'm going to go four now. <laughs> <laughs> playing a day, wasn't it? Was it called Playing play a day? A, that's right. Like, playing a yeah. day guitar guide, yeah. <laughs> I, I, um, I, I remember seeing there was a, an advert in the local paper shop. Which is the fish shop now, indeed, and with guitar for sale for guineas. Wow! And I, yeah, and I went, I went to this guy's house, pretended I knew everything about the guitar, and I, you know, I paid, I paid the four guineas, and uh, I never put it down. I, I, for you, I never put it down. I was absolutely yeah. transfixed with it. Yeah. Not, that, not that I'm a great musician or a great guitarist, but I never put it down. No. Your agent, if I remember, was a fellow called Bert Veal. Do you remember ah, Bert? Yeah, I, I went. I went in to buy some strings in Alpha Street, I think, in Neath. Uh, and he said, well, "What do you want these for?" So I played play guitar and you know, sing a bit. He said, "What do you fancy doing the clubs?" I said, "Well, nothing would. I'm open up to that." So he said, "Come and come and come and come and sing me some songs." I remember, and I sang the Warbash Cannonball, <laughs> <laughs> and the wreck of the FFE. I was into trains, the train songs at the time because that was a thing. So I remember auditioning for him, singing these these American country songs with thick Welsh Valley accent. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. How did you go down in the clubs then? Was it was it difficult, or did they understand oh, what yeah, you were trying yeah. to do? Uh, it, it was uh, as you well, everybody knows. It was it was a tough apprenticeship, you know. And I wasn't, and because I was like, I was really from the folk circuit, and and my style was a sort of bit lingy long, a bit of a storyteller. And in, in the clubs, then you had to have so sort of instant appeal, or a big singer, or whatever. Uh, and I I was I wasn't really suited in there. Uh, so I, I suffered in lots of places, and but it hardened me. And of course, uh, after a while, I give it all up. Then I was, I was, I was. Oh, it was a break my heart. You know, mm. we've been paid off and all that. Mm. Absolutely heartbreaking. So I went back to sort of folk clubs then, where they, what well, I've always said, they lent a willing ear, where they they listen mm. to you, and and you had time and time to develop and and trying to explain the songs. So then when I got confidence back, then I went back to the clubs with the, basically the same. Sort of songs, and um, and then of course when I started writing songs, that made the difference, yeah. Because mm. I was just yeah. a very, very ordinary sort of country singer, can folk singer. I remember yeah. you turning up in Britain Ferry Workman's. My old man was the pianist, I think, and I think yeah. that's the very first time we met. Well, yeah, it would have been, yeah. I would have one of the first time they ever performed as well. Wow. Yeah, yeah. In, in Clubland, yeah, because I was like a, a real fledgling at the time, and uh, and you were quite experienced even then. And all I had was a, was a Westminster amp, which, <laughs> which wouldn't drive, which wouldn't drive a clock. And, yeah. and I just sing, sing out to this, out to this, out to this amp with a speaker, voice yeah. and guitar. God, yeah. God. And you said, and you very kindly said, do you want to, do you want to use my PA system? Oh, oh God, like, Johnny Tudor. <laughs> and you had all the echo, you know, the sort of re reverb and echo and all that. So I, I sound like Geely, and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know you never know, do you? You, you know, you never know you who you touch along the way, and um, that's right, and that's I've right. never forgotten that. I always, uh, right. I always spoke right? very highly well, because at, at the time it meant so much to me at the time. Yeah, yeah. So if the clubs are uh, one one part, because you know, Johnny Tudor was uh, he was a legend in the clubs even in those days, wasn't he, Max? Yeah, he was. He was. He was like, a, and he was so much better than everybody else. You know, I was really, <laughs> really. He was. He was like, he was like a professional. We were just sort of. Real amateurs compared. Yeah, we yeah. were. 
<laughs> so if the clubs are one thing, the, the, there were a number of full clubs. Are, were there enough full clubs around for you to make a living, or were you sort of like a, a, no. a pro am? No, there were. There was only probably about maybe five or six the Soaring Wales. There was uh, Swansea, Bridgend, um obviously Valley Folk and Ponderdown. Mm. Um, some in the college and universities, but no, there weren't. No, no. Mm. I was working full time then. But didn't you do disco down as well? Because I did disco down. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I did disco down. Yeah, um, I always remember the, my vivid recollection of disco down. Wales are playing France out in Paris, so they decided you know, our disco down was coming on straight away after the match in Paris back in I don't know in the early seventies. So they said uh, Ruth Price said to me write, write a song for winning and write a song for losing. So I did. So we rehearsed the both songs all day, and we drew thirty all. <laughs> <laughs> so whenever, whenever I think of disco down, I shudder to think because I had to say, I had to say, I just, I, I, what can I do? So I said something like, "But well, if you're the one, if you're the one, I'm just sing this song." <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we were doing this thing, and there was all different singers on, and uh, um, Heather Jones and the Hennessys and and yeah. all people like that. And, uh, and we all had to finish the programme by singing, oh, me, it's, a, it's the singing barn, actually, not, not the disco down. We all sat on bales of hay, and we all go around and sing a verse, of, oh, Mary, don't you weep, don't you moan, oh, Mary, Mary's army got drowned, oh, Mary, don't you weep. And we all just sing a verse each other, it's the Hennessy's, Heather Jones, so we're, we're all around the circle. And at, at just before transmission, Heather Jones said, this is, this is the wrong key for me, can we change it E-flat? E flat. <laughs> I can play E flat. You say, give me the L flat in myself. <laughs> so, so, so Frank Hennessy play, played it to the hours for me, and I pretended playing it. So, oh, you get... <laughs> was that Howell Williams was the producer of that? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's right. Because they did I the singing Price. barn, the singing trail. I did the singing straights. It was up in yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. Derek Boot was in it. Was Derek? That's was right. I, Derek. Derek played. Derek played uh, bass on Live like, Yorkie. Yeah. Oh, that's right, aye. Oh. Um, oh writing God. the songs there, Max, did that come naturally to you or were you, were you, did somebody make you do it? How, how did those? How did that come about, writing songs? Naturally, I guess. I remember being influenced a bit by a guy, perhaps you won't have heard of, a guy called Alex Glasgow, who, oh. who was a quite well-known sort of folk singer in Newcastle mm-hmm. in the north of England. And he came down to the Valley Folk and Ponded Hour and he was singing, singing songs of the decline of the ship industry and, 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 on, on Times. And he wrote the thing called um, And the Time Slipped By, which is a lovely play on words. Yeah, and yeah. So, so I thought, oh, I'd love to do that sort of thing. So that sort of inspired me then to write sort of um, but the colliery closures at the time. And um, and then we, we later on, BBC Two did a series called uh, A Camera and a Song, where they introduced six singer-songwriters and six brilliant cameramen. And they... They, they they sort of put they, they put the two together the film and the words and and that's Glasgow as well when he wrote about about the northeast and I wrote about sort of South Wales wow. and uh, and uh, and Ralph Mattel wrote of London and that's how the streets of London came about wow. so it was all it was all integrated together yeah but the songs yeah. were serious then they weren't they weren't funny songs I wasn't no and I started no comedy at all mm. the nearest thing I came to comedy when I was doing the clubs and early days was Paddy McGinty's Goat. <laughs> <laughs> For younger but listeners, was, we should say Paddy McGinty's goat was a song when you got close to Paddy McGinty, <laughs> just in case. No, no, no. Yeah, well, the only comedy I did, and, and all my songs were, were straight, my own songs, they were serious songs and folk songs, and... Yeah. Uh, so you can imagine it wasn't uh, it wasn't the right subject here for for hard and satellite clubland. Yeah, uh, television then at that stage there were opportunities open. I disco down. That was was that was more pop music, wasn't it, Max? Rather than than your style, yeah, or did you do was. pop songs? Yeah, um, I, I didn't sing anybody else's songs. I just thought I'd only written four songs, I think. So they they, they had me on for a month, and then I didn't have any more songs. <laughs> Do you know what? I just have to learn these blinking songs before I learned Welsh, and I, could, yeah, exactly. I, I, I couldn't. And it was live in those days. They yeah, all yeah. Back out. And they should yeah. translate all these things. They, I remember how Gwyn Brin translated. Um, uh, what was it called? Uh, Winchester Cathedral. I can remember. Oh. Glock back and the ring <laughs> 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 I know, and they, they translate the songs. 
They're so nervous to be translated into Welsh. What a jump up and down and wave your knickers in the air. Oh, you remember that one? Yeah. Sounded horrendous in Welsh. <laughs> <laughs> and you ever Ryan did one for me too, is it? Uh, the girl from Ipanema. Tal as swell, Adele, Lagi, Ivan. It's imprinted in my brain. Yeah, I had to learn these songs. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, it's, all right, so disc, that's pop music. Uh, Poems and Pints, that was sort of a programme made for you, wasn't it? It was It was just right up your street. Yeah. It was it was absolutely yeah it was it was the most popular and still is I think uh, the most popular poetry based program that had ever been on television mm. and it gave me a, you know obviously it was on it for again they run out of songs so uh, I was I must have done about twelve of them but there was some like Ryan was on it and my Martin Griffith and oh, lots and lots of people who, yeah. who are no longer with us but mm. it was a brilliant program and um, and we just went to all these pubs and and. Uh, uh, and it, as I say, I should have I should have dropped out before I did before I because I was singing anything and I didn't <laughs> I didn't have anything else to write. <laughs> All right, so the, the 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 big break for Johnny it was opportunity knocks. Um, where where did the, where do you think life changed for you? What 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 was it? I did opportunity knocks. You see, and I remember vividly auditioned, and I, I was in the Patti Pavilion in Swansea. And Hugh Green was there and he said, right, and even then I was very, very, very difficult to do anything in two minutes, you know, because I wasn't, I wasn't my style. So he said, right, this, when this green light comes on, there's a green bulb and a red bulb. When the green light comes on, you start. And when the red bulb lights up, you finish. Right. So I must have been, oh, I can't believe I did it. I went up to the microphone and took the red bulb out. <laughs> <laughs> I did about 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it was a fantastic addition, and I was instantly on the programme. But then, of course, reality came to, to bite me. And, of course, on the programme, I only had, like, two minutes. Yeah. And I, I just I, I sang the song about Council Roadmen, which is impossible to sing in two minutes. Yeah. So, actually, I came second, but I, 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 I was never... I was should, I should have come last. I was not <laughs> very good. <laughs> But it had a huge following, didn't it? Like 20 million oh, people or something. You should watch I'm it. massive. I'm massive. Yeah, um, yeah. Were you, so, dis- were you disheartened after that, after not winning? Not oh, having the big broke, break? broke my heart. Broke my heart. And and um, and I I remember I'd been booked booked to appear by Neath Round Table in the Gwyn Hall in Neath with um, some big names. Um, mm. I can't remember. Arj Cutter and the Wurzels and Rainer Ronnie. And lots of big names and much bigger than me. And of course, in the meantime, they'd seen the program and they cancelled. They can after after seeing me, and I, oh, and, and, oh, I broke my. But I, I, I before that, I had done the the, the Harry Seacombe show in the Brangwen Hall in Swansea, and it had gone fantastic for me. And and um, so, uh, Gower and Lachlan round table, they were all raving about me too. Neath round table, and they said we want to we want to buy on tickets to see this boy again. So I said, I can't, you can't. I said, I'm not on it. They've, 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 they've they cancelled. Cancelled. Well, we don't want the tickets then, and they couldn't. They couldn't sell the tickets for me. And so I ended up. So I, I persuaded Dave Vaughan of Gownacha to buy the tickets. So I, I paid him. So I bought sixty tickets to come and see myself. <laughs> <laughs> broke, broke my heart. I, I, I cancelled because after seeing up, no, he's not up to it. He's, no, we don't want him. To do anything in two minutes is is difficult. I think for anybody. I mean, yeah. just, uh, you know me. I sing, dance, and impersonate. So I couldn't do it all in in. Oh, two no, not one, no, quite. It was really heartbreaking yeah. to, to be taken off that bill. Yeah. But as I say, through through Dive On, he told his story on This Is Your Life that um, oh, and I, he got me back on the bill and uh, it, it, it just went amazing. Um, yeah, the, and it was the night before Wales played the All Blacks, so you can imagine. The, the acts they had on, they couldn't, yeah. they couldn't follow it. You know, they couldn't. That's not. right, that's yeah. right. OK, so that's good, that's good. And then comes... Live at Triorki. Is that is that the turning point in your in your life? Yeah, 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 yeah. Where, where what made that work? It was only through a bit of experience, I suppose. Is that I cut an album in the Ivy Bush Pub in Pontanella, and uh, of course it, it, it's okay, but um, because it, the, the audience there were only about maybe twenty people in an upstairs room in a pub, and they'd heard the songs all before, so the reaction wasn't as wonderful as it would have been because obviously they, they'd heard it all before. So mm-hmm. I made a conscious effort then going to find somewhere that I thought would appreciate my my work, somewhere like any some of them, so the same background, 
So I chose Chalky. I don't really know why, uh, because at the time I went to Pendergry first, uh, and they said, oh, no, we haven't got a room big enough. Go down, go down. Chalky's got a bigger room around here. So that's the reason I did Chalky. It is a gamble, but a gamble that paid off totally because yeah. because it was completely fresh, those songs. I trusted the songs. And by then, they'd been honed in mm-hmm. over a couple of years. So And I'd done it once before, which is a massive thing. So then there were all our people in, in that order were hearing all the songs, Him Sinaris and Dewey's Heart, for the yeah. first time. And the action was honest and genuine and real. And yeah. that's what made that album. Because, yeah, uh, yeah. now then, Johnny, you've got a connection with uh, with Max's producer from that record, haven't you? Yeah, Bob Barrett. Um, yeah. I met Bob Barrett in Gibraltar in 1971, I think. It was 1970. I was doing the Gibraltar Song Festival. And he was yeah. out there with a singer. When I, he had some girl singer under his, in, under his wing at the time. Uh, so he was out there. He, was, he used to make me laugh. He used to write everything down in a notebook. And, I uh, and I used to say, get it down in a book, Bob. You know, he was being, came a running joke in the end. He put everything down in a bloody notebook. You know. I did. Did you get through Benny Litchfield? Is that how you got in touch with him? No, I, no, it happened via. Um, I was when I when I did that show in the Harry Seacom show at the yeah. Brangwen Hall. Uh, Morrison Office Choir were on the bill as well, and they they were recording for EMI, and they're all telling Bob about this boy that stolen, this complete unknown boy from Greece, who stolen the show. And uh, so he happened to be in a he happened to be in a shop in Swansea, and he saw the album when I cut in Pondera for sale. So he bought yeah. it, and and they and they, they came to see me in concert then and. And offered oh, me a contract. fantastic! Yeah, fantastic. And I signed for, I think it was. Uh, bear in mind, I wrote every word of it, every note of music of it, and they paid me one and a half percent. Oh, they were terrible in those days, weren't they? <laughs> it's as bad as Lonnie Donegan. He had fifteen quid. He told me for Rock mm. Island Line. Yeah, he was yeah. on as a session man, and he only got fifteen quid. Yeah, but it sold. I mean, it sold in bucket loads, didn't it? I mean, it just yeah, how, nearly, how quickly half a million. How quickly mm. did that happen? Do you know, was it an overnight? And how was it a success? You know, who was buying it? How did people find out about it? Was it on the radio? Was it on the TV? It was word of mouth, yeah. Like it goes viral, like the thing goes viral today. It was like that, but people were buying and say, "Oh, you got to go," and 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 they couldn't, they couldn't print enough. Mm-hmm. It, it just, it just. Yeah, went viral, but not through television or anything, just by word of mouth, yeah. People buy yeah, in record yeah. shops. They couldn't print enough. The bloke in, in Tenby shop, he, he made a fortune. He was the only shop in Pembroke that had the record. He bought them all. <laughs> <laughs> Dale. Dale's music shop. Oh. They said it's a big actor now, Dale. Oh. Yeah. Wow. You know, the funny thing is, Mac, because we, we, we bought the album as a family and we loved, loved Lime Jockey. And, and as you probably know, you know, my background was, was being signed by Elton John. And at the time, I was being produced by a guy called Gus Dudgeon. Now, Gus Dudgeon had produced Life on Mars for David Bowie. He'd produced yeah, all right. the Elton John hits and he was working in Rockfield. So he came down with his wife and a bit of an entourage and he came to our house for tea and he was my producer. And so <laughs> I was ever so proud. And all night, we made him listen to Live in Trio. Oh, I, know. I, I, I had it on the ring. I said, you're going to have to listen to this. This is fantastic. I so Gus I know, Dudgeon, I, he, I, I made Gus Dudgeon a fan of Max Boyce. So there we are. Oh, the man. I know. It's uh, absolutely ridiculous. It was ridiculous. The, 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 what happens then? Because, you, you, you know, you weren't, you weren't managed by Bert anymore in the in the Neath. Who's this guy now? This guy from Manchester. How do you get in touch with him, this guy well, the, the, what, what it was, the Daily Mail had run an article saying that this um, uh, about uh, uh, Matt, a rugby master the day before, it said, try scored by Gareth Edwards, converted by Phil Bennett, the words and music, Max Boss. <laughs> so so they, did, they did a big article saying that I, that I wrote, all, like, like you just mentioned, I wrote everything down the back of a bit of paper and, yeah. and I had no manager, no agent, nothing. And, then, and of course, I'd have... Every read this, and every manager from all over in Britain came down to see me. And uh, <laughs> and I, and, and, but Stewart then, you know, obviously Stewart Tour came down and, and he said, Listen, I, you know, I realize everybody's been down to see you. And um, but he said, I don't need to sign anything, just let's see. I'm, I'm just starting out myself. Um, let's see how it goes. If it goes well, great, but I don't need to sign anything. So I thought, Oh, I can't go wrong with that. And he was very personable. Yeah. And he slept on, he slept on the couch of my mother's house, which I was very impressed with. <laughs> so, um, and we've been, you know, he's been with me ever since. And he went That's on Kennedy his, Street artist, isn't it? At the, at the start, but he was, yeah. you know, went on his I, own now. But um, at the start, remember, he was kept, Yeah, that's right. I well, remember Kennedy the fella. Street, yeah. Well, they had a 10 CC and all sorts of people. That's right. Yeah, all the Manchester stuff. 
Yeah. Wasn't uh, he wasn't he working out so, of a telephone box at the end of his street or something those early days? Yeah, he he, he had he had uh, he used to pretend you know he used to pretend uh, that, that he was a big agent and he used to people to ring up this number. And he was in a telephone box outside his near his house. So he said, ring me. I'm very busy. Can you ring me between seven and quarter past? So we used to dominate that kiosk there from seven and quarter past to take all these calls. And he did it all from a telephone kiosk. So I thought, yeah, you'll do that'll do me. That I was very impressed with that. Were you professional yeah, yeah. when you did the first album, when you did that live in Triochi? Were you still or, or were you still oh, just weeks? Mm. Weeks or so, yeah. Yes, mm. weeks into it. I think I'd finished in I sort of finished in October, I think, and I, I cut the album in November. But what's fascinating you'd find is that that was, from start to finish, as it was, there wasn't a word or a note and it edited at all. It just, that's mm. exactly what it was. And how that worked to just a, a freak, it, it would never, I could never do that again. Because to 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 mix comedy and and and, and see the songs like Do It's Hard and, and Did You Understand, the mood shift is huge. So it, it, it sometimes the song that follows something that's gone sensational, it, it, it suffers in comparison. Mm-hmm. So you can never get all the songs to be as good as they can be. Mm-hmm. But on like they all did. They all worked as as well as I wanted them to work, which mm-hmm. is a bit of a thing of magic. Very chances. Magic, isn't it? It's magic, but that is magic. It was magic. To go from say to go from hymns and ours with this raucous laughter, starting to sing about the about the minor strike mm-hmm. was yeah. was yeah. And but they they shifted with me, you know. Yeah. But I, I I don't think I could do it again. I wouldn't try again. <laughs> but it was authentic, Max, because you'd come from that culture. You weren't making it up. You weren't writing about anybody else's story. Yeah. This was you know you lost your dad. Uh, you'd, yeah. you'd you'd worked in this industry all all those years. Um, yeah. It, it was it wasn't just something you'd read about. No, it's a, a broke review did actually the other day, and uh, a lot, I only I saw it the other day, the, the review. And he said, "Whatever else it is, he said it's authentic." Mm. You know, yeah, that's that's the word he used. Whatever else you can say, it's authentic. You can only write from your own experience, really, truly, can't you? Mm. I think yeah, that's true I, of anything. I think Laurie, Laurie Lee, who I love, wrote that one's almost without exception, man's best work is from is from first experience, whether it's lost love or tragedy, or whatever. Mm. But it mm. impacts on them, and and you you can't write. I don't think you can write second hand. Mm. He's got I think you've got to live through it for to, to have its authenticity. Mm. Yeah, you, yeah. One big hit, uh, then you've got to do it again. And you did. Yeah. I mean, what was the pressure well, like did. the second album? Well, ah, it was enormous because A I, I, I the thing was I wish I you know, I wish I could have another go at that because again, unlike the first one, I'd never sang these songs before. They they so I did have a chance to to hone them in through performance, mm-hmm. of repeated performance. Which the song is better and shorter. So some of the songs on the second album, we all adopt as papers. I never sang in my life before. The first time was was because I didn't know where the laughter lines are. I didn't know. Mm-hmm. So it was. Um, I, I should have waited. I should have waited. So, you know, I go. I got to hone these in. It would have been a better album. You know, because it, some of it is very rough indeed and too long. <laughs> But the pressure, you know, to to have another hit, you know, to come up, yeah, with, it must have yeah. been enormous. On and you were a young man from from Glenith. It wasn't like you'd, you know, at least Johnny no, would have had his dad to to back him up and say, no, wait, yeah. wait a minute, son, and and all that. But you yeah, were no, it was oh, when it when it uh, to go to number one like was just you know unheard of, and it's still it's I mean the Guinness Book of Records is the only comedy album ever to go to number one, you know, which is was remarkable. And uh, again, I I I just wish I'd. Uh, some of the songs I wish I'd uh, had more time to get to, to get them better than they should have been. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It was a magical. Yeah, yeah, well, no, we, we all, I'm sure we'd all think that about bits and parts of our career. In fact, the whole of my career, Max. If I could give it another go <laughs> <laughs> from the start, like just give me 1973 again. Um, writing books, uh, the, the touring that came out of that thing, because it, it was enormous and TV shows uh, uh, and all of that. Mm. And then, you know, going around the world. I mean, I, I, I know I've been lucky enough to go to, well, Hong Kong, Korea, yeah. Australia, New Zealand. And, and I have sure, to say, yeah. and I, I, every time I get the chance to say it, you changed my life, Max. You know, that phone call I had in 1987, <laughs> I went to Boy Johnny and I came back a man. No, it was just fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you, you've, you've had a chance to go around. But I remember in 1987, you went on a, on a, on a tour to that part of the world because cause the Rugby World Cup. Yeah, well, it, it seemed to fit in, you know, and uh, and I, I wanted every you know everything I could use to, I didn't know any people would come to see me at shows. So we, we took on, first of all, we, we just took on small, small halls, 
but we had to cancel all the small halls because uh, there were so many people who wanted to go. Mm-hmm. So we ended up playing, you know, playing three thousand seaters in the region theatre in Sydney, and um, yeah. and it was it was uh, it was a remarkable time. Right? But I, I never ever dreamt I could go to places like Australia and South Africa and mm-hmm. Canada and play to the biggest theatres in in the cities there, especially South Africa. Cause mm-hmm. I, I'd never been there. I'd never no connections there whatsoever. And, and they flocked the concerts. They're big rugby fans, though, in Australia and South Africa. Huge. Well, that, that obviously that, that helped as well. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But what made it though was that there was a guy called um, uh, it was Gareth Harris and the Steady on the Lions tour of '74, uh, and he was like the Wogan of South Africa on the radio, and he said, "You've got to go and see this man live." And just by the power of radio mm. and his influence on viewers and listeners. They flocked to the concerts, and I had to do after the first concert. The, the, you know, the the review was amazing, and I had to do like I did a week in in this in this theatre in Johannesburg. A week, you know, mm-hmm. incredible. Mm-hmm. I think the first night was probably fifty percent Welsh people, but the second, third, or fourth, obviously they were then all people, you know, yeah. South mm-hmm. Africans. And now, but I didn't have yeah. to change the act a great deal. But that's, the trust. Well, that's the funny thing, though, because my, uh, in, in talking to Johnny in the past, uh, a lot of the people that he, he'd worked with didn't travel terribly well because it was, it was parochial, you know, and it was very, yeah, very yeah. popular here in Wales. Um, and then Johnny's managed to go around the world, Singapore and all that, and do his act. What I was very impressed, and I've told Johnny about this before, was when we went on that tour of Southeast Asia, we went to Korea. Now, there was one boy from Trathloin. Um, <laughs> in Swansea, everybody yeah, else, uh, everybody else was uh, American, and yeah. I, I wondered how you would go down that night. I mean, but it was fantastic because you were you you had so many stories, like going to the Dallas Cowboys. You managed to. Were you scared? Were you scared that night when you go to a place where? Oh, of course, I of course I was, um, and and I well, of course I was. I, and I didn't expect that sort of reaction, but it was, it was a mixture of naivety and innocence. I, I just the whole I I just thought the whole world knew about the things I was talking about, which mm. and if if you if you and I think with my folklore background where you explain the songs before you sing them, that stood me in good stead because I could say well this song and and I explained the song like this is Ron the Grey the line in it the tools are on the bar I explained what he meant the tools on the bar was synonymous with the health and dust and whatever if I explained yeah. it then. It, 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 I didn't. I didn't have to do any more than that. And uh, but no, I, I never expected the reactions I had in was in the far off places. No, it was, mm. it was it was amazing, amazing. Yeah, uh, we, we are running out of time, boys. So uh, I'm <laughs> going to start to start to wind this up if if possible. I mean, obviously, still still very busy, Max, and still writing. Like at the beginning of you know this whole COVID um, pandemic, y- you wrote something which again just touches a nerve. It is like magic when something like goes all around the world. Tell, can you tell us about how you wrote it and, and, and the reaction that it had? Well, I, I, some people, first of all, some people uh, asked me to write something and some nurses wrote to me, would I write something to lift their spirits and all that and uh, and and put it online and I, I, I tried and it's very difficult to, to write something like that and introduce humour into it. Uh, but then I was coming home from Swansea, as it happens, um, from visiting my granddaughter, and uh, and all the all the streets, all the streets were like locked and shut, and all everything was quiet, not deserted. And as you know, when Mumbles there, the tide was out miles. And as the tide was going out miles, and I thought, well, you know, at least the tide's still going out anyway, you know. <laughs> so I thought, yeah, there's a song there. So I thought, when once I got the title, when just the tide went out, the rest then sort of fell into place. Last night as I lay sleeping, when dreams came fast to me, I dreamt I saw Jerusalem beside a tideless sea. And one dream I'll remember as the stars began to fall was Banksy painting Alan Wynne on my neighbour's garage wall. And dreams like that sustain me till these darkest times have passed and chase away the shadows no caring night should cast. But times like this can shine a light as hardship often can to see the best in people and the good that is in man. And I remember Swansea with nobody about when the shops were closed like Sunday and just the tide went out. And I remember Mumbles with the harbour in his keep and the little boat at anchor that fished the waters deep. And I heard the seabirds calling as the gulls all wheeled about, but all the town was sleeping now and just the tide went out. And when these days are over and memories remain, 
when children painted rainbows and the sun shone through the rain. And the thought of all the nurses who stretched all the pain. And I hope the carers never see a time like this again. And I prayed last week for Boris, who knocked on heaven's door. And I thought of voting Tory, which I'd never done before. And though the sun is shining now, I have no immediate plans. So I'll write a book on staying in and ways to wash your hands. And now, more days of lockdown, three weeks of staying in, and I'm running out of vodka, so I started on the gin. And my neighbours are complaining, I've heard them scream and shout with the sound the bins are making when I take the empties out. Um, and when all this is over and our fragile world survives, I hope that God is caring now for the ones who gave their lives. I pray we'll find an answer if my faith is cast in doubt and God draws back the heavens and all the stars come out. And I'll remember mornings with nobody about and the shops are closed like Sunday and just the tide went out. Fabulous. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Lovely. brilliant. Um, w- yeah. When this is all over, um, back on the road, yeah. Max? No, back on the... Together, the... Oh, yeah. well, that would be lovely. That would be... I, 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 the the, the moment of being over, uh, <laughs> new verse, I want... Uh, some wanted Christmas cancelled, but the piper calls the tune. And hark the herald angels sing, wouldn't sound the same in June. So I'll, you for, I'll wait you for my vaccine, but I know there's some delay. So I'll order mine on Amazon, and I'll get it yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Max, lo- lo- thank you very much for your time. And uh, Johnny, thanks for lending Max the uh, the gear. At least that... Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> quite. Have you, have you still working underground now? <laughs> I know, I know. I made you what you had today. <laughs> you know, you made me. <laughs> um, so hey, I, love this. Yeah. Great to see you, Maxie. Yeah, see you. After all and this time, too. we must Both get together you. again. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. And as we say at the end, it's goodbye from me, or it's goodbye from him, it's goodbye from him. Goodbye. Yeah. I was, I was goodbye. goodbye from Maxie. <laughs> goodbye. So now, Max, see you soon, bye. Have a good one.